Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this 11th lecture on this course on the psychology of language. Now before we progress and understand a little bit more about words, let us take a quick recap into what we have been doing over the past 10 lectures. So we will quickly go through all the concepts that we have done uh, and we will continue from where we uh, left off in the last class which was class number 10. Now, the course was designed to understand uh, language, what is language and why do we need language and we started off by explaining this idea of language not from a linguistic point of view but from a psycholinguistic point of view meaning which uh, we were uh, primarily focused on the psychology or the psychological aspects of language. So, the outline of the course was designed in such a way that we will only touch the psychological aspects of a language and looking at language as a cognitive process. So, the first two lectures we, uh, which we did, I was trying and explaining to you what is language first of all and what is the need for language and a little bit of history into how language started. So, at the very beginning, I picked up the very idea of what language is and how it is different from communication. So, uh, we saw the very primitive form of language which is called animal communication system. We looked at why animals communicate and what is the characteristic of a language like that. And after looking uh, uh, on that, we move forward and compared this with the human language system. As you know that animal languages have minimalistic uh, idea conversion which basically means that they can generate and share only minimum ideas. With human language, a number of ideas can be generated and shared. So, we looked at what is the difference between them. So, after looking at the most primitive form of language which is the animal communication system, we moved on to understanding what is human language and how does human language progress and what is the structure of human language right from the <coughs> phonemes to the morphemes to the sentence discourse and so on and so forth. So, moving along the axis. And then towards the end of this lecture, we started dwelling into the idea of how language started, where, where is the history of language. So, we looked at uh, things like how uh, in the evolutionary cycle or in the evolutionary uh, time scale, how language developed up. There we also uh, verified certain aspects or certain evidences uh, to look at how uh, language evolved uh, from uh, the, the primitive humans to the modern form which it has. We looked at several evidences like for example, the idea of Pitgins and the idea of proto language and how these provide evidences or support to the fact that language developed in uh, both a fast manner and a slow manner. So, we looked at these two theories also competing theories of language development which one is a slow theory, the other is a fast theory of language development. Now, obviously, once we are done with uh, what is language and what is the basic and history of it, uh, the next two chapters we dedicate entirely to looking at uh, the scientific research methodology used in language. So, we looked at a uh, little bit into the scientific methodology starting with uh, the discussion on what is uh, theory, what is uh, how is theory uh, leading to generating of hypotheses, how these hypotheses are tested and based on the hypothesis testing, how the theory is either refuted or additions to the theory is done both using the inductive and the deductive methodology to it. So, we uh, discussed in detail uh, all the uh, components of a uh, good scientific research. And then we took up some uh, classic um, uh, examples from language research and we explained the whole uh, theoretical procedure uh, based on uh, these, these uh, classical research uh, in, in language. Towards the end of this section, uh, we looked at 
the brain regions which are involved in language and discuss little bit about the Broca and the Wernicke area which is the two main area for language. Further to it, uh, uh, we also looked at certain neuro uh, imaging techniques and electrophysiological techniques which are used for studying language and the brain in action while producing languages. So, that is that is the content of uh, the third and the fourth chapter. Now, from the fifth chapter to the sixth chapter, we were looking at how people perceive language. So, if something is said to you, how do you respond to it? How do you understand it? That was what the main concern was in uh, the fifth and sixth lecture. And there what we were looking at is first of all, how do people perceive speech. So, speech basically is a form of wave and so we looked at the properties of wave like amplitudes and uh, frequencies and how these amplitudes and frequencies and uh, the, uh, the uh, overtones, the fundamental frequency, these concepts of the wave and how they are explored in terms of uh, in terms of sound waves. So, how, how uh, these properties are explained in, in, in the psychological domain. Not only that, we looked at the, the functioning of the human ear and how uh, the basal, uh, uh, the, the, the in working of the inner ear, uh, the basilar membrane, how that and its projections to uh, the, the primary auditory cortex and secondary auditory cortex, how uh, they help us in perceiving uh, the language that was uh, the concern of the first part of it. And then we also looked at how the development of speech perception uh, happened uh, or happens in young children and, and how does it progress throughout the uh, uh, adult age and uh, several questions into that uh, this particular domain was what we were interested in. Now, once we were familiar with uh, how people perceive language or uh, how people understand language or spoken language for that matter, uh, we went into looking at how people produce language that was uh, the section 8 and uh, 7 and 8. So, in uh, 7 and 8 section, we were looking at the production of language and so, a uh, lot of emphasis was put on uh, the definition of uh, the voice box, the whole vocal tract system and how this vocal tract system uh, basically help us in producing languages. <coughs> We detailed the idea of how uh, the phonemes are produced and the basic phone sounds which are uh, the consonants and vowels, how they are produced, uh, what do they mean, what are the various inflections, what are the various um, uh, exceptions and things like that. So, everything related to that is what our concern was in uh, the, uh, the section on producing of language. Uh, other to that, what we did was we also focused on how the production of language takes place in, in uh, both in infants and how in infants develop this language production, how uh, uh, two language production is developed and how this whole uh, story of language production, it, it moves from right from birth to the point of time when the child is able to produce more than 10,000 words which is uh, when he when he when he is more than 8 years of age. So, that story is what we covered in that section. Uh, after that, so once we are able to uh, understand both the production and perception of speech, what was next was the next level of our uh, dedication or the next level of interest for us was studying what is the word. So, what is the meaning of word? and what does word do? Now, why we were interested in understanding the word? Uh, the basic concept is that word is that point from which we have a clear cut distinction. Below the level of the word, we have phonemes and we have morphemes and they do not make any meaning as such. So, it is they are not proper language and above the language of word, we have sentences and discourse and syntax and grammar and those kind of things. So, word is the gateway which starts making meaning or at at a uh, word is that particular point from which meaning starts getting generated. So, that is that is what the concern was and so we were more interested in studying word. So, uh, lecture number 9, 10 and this lecture which is 11, we dedicated entirely to studying words. So, we started off a journey on studying words by first looking at what the anatomy of a word is. So, basically what are words, how words resemble sound symbols 
for different kind of words. So, the meaning of a word is related to the concept of uh, concept it symbolizes and the concept that it symbolizes is related to the mental representation. So, how words take on uh, meanings and how these meanings are represented into uh, the mind in forms of mental representation is what our interest was. So, we looked at uh, uh, this kind of a anatomy. We looked at the cognitive uh, approaches to word learning and uh, we looked at how semantic primes and embodied representations these are in sound symbolism and how they explain uh, the anatomy of a word. <coughs> then the next idea was how do children learn words and so that was what it is and so we, we found um, that the word learning was actually in a S shape curve. The initially the children learn from 0 to 18 months the word learning is very slow, but there is a spurt from 18 months to 6 years of age where the word learning is very fast and after 6 years ahead <coughs> the word learning drops. Now, this spurt is believed to uh, the fact that children acquire something called insight and they start learning more words and they and also uh, why this spurt is there from, uh, from 18 uh, months to 6 years is because the children have developed a mastery over the phonology. Also, the memory has developed and so there is this, this particular um, uh, issue was there. So, we are looking at that kind of approaches and we are looking at uh, constraints in word learning and uh, several kind of uh, assumptions and, and uh, so on and so forth into the idea of word uh, learning and how uh, several other factors for example, being in the neighborhood and those kind of things actually help us in learning words. The next issue which was of concern to us is how words are stored. So, what is the way in which words are stored into the men mental lexicon? Now, most of you have seen a dictionary. Now, what is a dictionary? A dictionary is a place or it is a, it's a kind of a book which stores the base form, the lemma form of a word and we discussed this before lemma is the basic abstract form of any word and so, the dictionary stores the lemma form of a word. Now, in the dictionary, if you take in a word, you will get both the phonological uh, the, the, the pronunciation of the word as well as the meaning. So, in a dictionary, both the phonological form and the semantic form which is the meaning is stored. But most dictionaries are arranged in alphabetical order, they are arranged in from A to Z order. These days, when you are looking for word meaning, what you do is you type it into a browser, a Google browser or, or any browser and immediately the word comes to you. Now, the way the mind stores the word is in this form, it can immediately give you the meaning, but then mind also stores the word into both the phonological form and, and the semantic form. So, basically what we were interested in is to know how words are stored into the human mind, what is the way in which it is stored first thing and later on we will be also looking at how words are retrieved from the human mind. So, uh, the mental lexicon is a place it's or it's it's a form of memory in which information about words are stored. Mental lexicon is the storage of information about words in long term memory. And this information as we looked at uh, which is stored in the long term memory is in two forms. We have the phonological form and we have the semantic form. Now, any word which is stored in, in the long term memory is in terms of its pronunciation, is in terms of how the phoneme, various phonemes or speech sound they com comprise together to form syllables and then further on uh, to comprise of what the word. Uh, or how the word is pronounced. The other way in which a word is from or the other uh, fact characteristic of any word is the semantic form. So, basically the meaning of it, what it symbolizes, what it means, what is the mental representation that it is, uh, uh, is, is influencing. And so, words are stored both as phonemes uh, and uh, and uh, so, basically they are stored as phonemes as well as semantic. So, how do we know that <coughs> words are stored in terms of phonemes or the mental lexicon has words stored in terms of basic phones and that comes from uh, the, the explanation for that comes from speech errors, the kind of speech errors that we uh, that we do and so look at this, uh, we often tend to make this kind of speech errors. For example, saying uh, keep your feet moving, we tend to say keep your foot moving and so this kind of change in phones basically suggests that words which are stored uh, in, in the long term memory, they are stored in their basic phonological form. One way of storing it is in the phonological form or in terms of how they are pronounced or we also make errors like take my bike becomes bake my, uh, uh, bake my bike.
So, the B becomes T and this is basically because phonological errors the way they sound that is uh, somehow changed and so words are stored uh, one way of storing word is in terms of the phonological. <laughs> now, it is been believed that the most only the most basic forms of the word are actually stored in the long term memory. So, not all forms of words are actually stored in the long term memory only the basic forms of the word are uh, stored in the long term memory and other forms are generated through certain rules. So, one theory believes that only the basic forms are stored and then other forms are uh, of the word. For example, if you want to make plurals or if you want to add suffixes to a word or if you want to make any kind of other derivations to the word that can be done by using certain rules. So, only you have the basic form and that is what it is. So, Dax become Dax says or Blick becomes Blick is because what is stored is Dax and Blick are the ones which are stored and one way to look at that, uh, that uh, words are stored in the lemma form is because we can make plurals of non words also. And so, non if we can make plurals of non words which basically says that the, the idea of making plurals it comes from certain rules it is not the, uh, the words are not stored in or plurals are not stored into the mental lexicon. Now, irregular form separate entities by analogy. So, there are certain irregular forms also in which uh, the words are uh, uh, stored and so, these irregular form uh, certain words words or certain irregular forms of words are uh, are also stored into the uh, <coughs> mental lexicon. So, for uh, some forms of word both the forms or uh, uh, let us say uh, the, the lemma uh, or, or um, the other forms of the word are also stored. For example, look at foot and feet and moves and mees. In this case, the plural of foot and feet or moves and mees and this kind of uh, plural making uh, does not happen through certain rules because what is happening is the word itself is getting changed. And so, in this case is what happened is both the words the singular as well as the plural is actually stayed in, uh, stored into the mental lexicon. Now, another interesting thing is to, uh, to look at uh, the idea of inflectional suffix and derivational suffix. And these inflectional, so suffixes are basically certain words which are added to the ba basic lemma forms of the word and when you add these suffixes what happens is the meaning of the word changes. And so, by looking at something called inflectional suffix and derivational suffix, we can uh, think of or we can uh, basically predict that how words are stored into the long term memory onto the mental lexicon. So, what is inflectional suffix? It is added to pur the purpose of grammar. So, any suffix which is added to a lemma form of a word the basic abstract form of a word. So, that this addition changes the grammar of the word that is called inflectional uh, suffix. For example, look at toy and toys what is happening the grammar is changed why it is become plural or play plays and again it is uh, plural played and playing. So, play plays played and playing in this case this is, it becomes from singular to plural in this case what has become what has happening is that the tense marker is changing is, is changing from present continuous tense to past tense to so on and so forth and so the grammar is changing and so inflectional suffix basically suggests that uh, these kind of suffixes are added to words so that what happens is that the word changes its grammar only the grammatical property uh, changes. Now, uh, the other kind of suffix which is of interest is something called the derivational suffix. And so, what is these suffixes? These changes the meaning in grammatical category. So, in on one hand we have the inflectional suffix which only changes the grammar of a word. We have the derivational suffix which not only changes the grammar of a word, but also changes something called the meaning of the word. And so, sometimes what happens is adding certain suffixes make verb into a noun. <coughs> Look at it. We have agree as a verb and you add the suffix meant into it and what you get is a noun. So, this kind of suffixes or this kind of uh, uh, word endings can change not only the grammatical form of a word, but also the meaning of the word. And so, agree agreement and agreeable are three different things. And so, it becomes an adjective by saying by changing the able by adding the able and the meant which are two different suffixes the verb becomes either a noun or it becomes a uh, adjective. So, uh, what does it all say? What it says is that words are basically stored in the phonological way or in, th in their words are stored in the mental lexicon in the form of their pronunciations in the form of their phonological 
character. Now, another interesting thing to look here is something called the base frequency effect. And so, what is the base frequency effect? The base frequency effect is a very simple thing, which means that the frequency effect of the base form extends to its inflicted form, which basically means that the more frequently a word, particular word is, is uh, tackled or is uh, met with the higher the chances that other inflection forms of the word will also be tackled in the same way. So, the amount of time you are uh, you are uh, requiring for understanding the base of uh, uh, base word and the more frequently you have accessed or you have uh, seen the base form, the, the same amount of time or the same lower time will be spent by you in, look, in, in uh, finding out or in realizing the inflection forms of the word. Now, frequency affects the ba uh, base for extended to inflection forms. Also derived form in no change in pronunciation for example an agreement. So basically what it says is not all derived forms uh, exhibit the base frequency effect. Now what happens is that the more frequently you, you are familiar with a word, uh, generally what happens is other inflection forms, other suffixed form of the word uh, will also be recognized at the same speed. But then there is a catch to it and what is the catch? It says that not all derived form or the word exhibits the base frequency effect. For example, look at the, uh, the suffix ity and add, uh, add it to the adjective serene, what you get is something called serenity, which is a noun. Now, if you look at the word recognition for serene, how much time do you take for identifying serene? Uh, it has a faster reaction time. People are able to uh, uh, react faster in, in uh, understanding serene, but serenity, the word itself, it has uh, people uh, or uh, for understanding the word serenity, people take more reaction time or peter, uh, people are more slower in understanding serenity. Now, so basically then uh, how do we solve this idea of how the base form and the inflected forms are stored into the, uh, into the mental lexicon. On one hand, we have this idea that uh, the only the pure lemma form is stored and other forms are governed by rules and there are certain uh, exceptions to it where we have all the forms which are stored to it. Now, if you look at the connectivist approach which provides an answer to how all the forms of a word are stored into the metal lexicon, the connectivist approach solves this problem uh, by saying that all word forms both the inflectional and the derivational have separate entries into the mental lexicon. So, the, uh, the connectivist approach basically proposes that all forms of the word, maybe the lemma form, the inflectional form, the grammatical form, any other or uh, the derivative form, all forms of the word have a separate entry into the mental lexicon, which means that each word has a representation into the mental. Now, let us explore this mental lexicon that we are talking about. Now, mental lexicon is the mental dictionary. We know that we have mental dictionary because there is a phenomena called the tip of the tongue phenomena. And so, why does tip of the tongue phenomena happen? The tip of the tongue phenomena happens because what happens is when we are trying to and this this is a uh, is, is a very famous thing. So, there are times when you when you remember what a word is made up of, what is the first letter of a word, you know meanings of what the word is or particular name is and but you are not able to retrieve the word. And this happens because what has happened is you are able to access the lemma form of the word which is the ba basic abstract form of the word, but you are not able to access the derivational forms because it is a derivational form that you want to remember and that error in generating the derivational form is what is the reason for the uh, tip of the tongue phenomena and this also explains that mental lexicon is arranged in form of a network and this network has nodes and so activity spreads through these nodes. We will come back to that in a moment. So, how do we explain the mental lexicon or explore the mental lexicon? Now, let us play a little game. Now, when I say dog and you, what you have to do is quickly tell, tell me what comes to your mind. So, when I say dog, you say cat or some people will also say bone. Now, the way you are expressing the word which comes with dog, be it a, uh, be it a cat or a bone, uh, is basically two forms of how the, uh, the word dog or the meaning of the word dog is represented into your memory. Now, exploring the mental lexicon is done through something called the word association task. And so, what is the word association task? It is a simple procedure in which the participants, they are asked to produce a word in response to a prompt. So, I will say dog and you will say whatever comes first to your mind. And so, that is what the word association task is. And so, the way you define the, uh, the 
the target word. So, the word I present is called the cue and the word you give me after hearing my cue word is called the target word. So, words in men mental lexicon generally are arranged in two forms in terms of its semantic relatedness. So, most word in the mental uh, lexicon is arranged in terms of its semantic relatedness and this semantic relatedness of any word into the mental lexicon is basically uh, arranged in terms of either the thematic relation or the taxonomic relation. And so, what is the semantic relation? So, when I say dog and bone, they are thematically related, but when I say dog and cat, they are related in terms of something called the uh, taxonomic relation. So, what is thematic relation? Word relation based on frequency of co-occurrence. So, basically if a particular word uh, co-occurs with a word more number of times, this type of relationship between two words are called thematic relations, but the relationship between words uh, uh, be, uh, uh, which occur because they are from the same category, uh, this type of uh, this type of relationship is called taxonomic. And so, what happens is both dog and uh, cat are from the same animal category and so this kind of relationship that they share with uh, each other is called taxonomic in nature, but when I say dog and you say bone to me, it is thematic relation because they occur together or they occur with the same frequency. So, what is thematic relationship? The relationship which is based on frequency of co-occurrence uh, of words are called uh, thematic relationship for example, dog and bone. And so, what is taxonomic relationship? It is the relationship based on category membership for example, dog and animal and the category here is called animals and so this is how <coughs> words are stored. Now, how does the word uh, the, these, these kind of relationship explode? This is explored by something called the word association task and so what does it do? Participants produce one or more words in response to a prompt. For if I say dog, you will produce bone, ca cat, tail, fur and mailman. And so, young children they form generally something called thematic relationships in, uh, that means that words are related in terms of in terms of frequency of co-occurrence. And older children produce something called taxonomic relationship. Now, older children they have more knowledge and so they have more idea of what, how two things are related in terms of uh, in terms of the category, in terms of the higher order concepts, but smaller children they generally relate words in terms of co-occurrences. So, although dog and cat are not related to each other, but through a category they are related and the category here is animals. So, how do we explore the mental lexicon? Now, psycholinguists they conceptualize the mental lexicon as a network of words or concepts connected to each other by semantic links and that is what I have started my uh, explanation of mental lexicon with. Psycholinguists believe that words and concepts they are related to each other through some kind of a semantic link. So, links between so uh, and these links that they uh, that the word and concepts have in the semantic network or in in the, the the semantic space of long term memory can be expressed in terms of two different kind of links i can have a is a link which replace categorical relations or i can have a has and can relationship between uh, words and this can be semantic in nature so i can have these two type of links or relationship so two words or two uh, concepts in, in the mental lexicon which is explained as a network model that is what I was trying I started off uh, by exp uh, my explanation of mental lexicon with that has two kind of relationships. So, words in a network. So, first of all words are arranged as networks which basically means that one word is connected to another word and that is how the mental lexicon is first thing and so these relation relationships can have can be in terms of categories or it can in, in, uh, in terms of taxonomy. So, categories is taxonomy or in terms of frequency of occurrences which is in terms of the themes or thematic relationship and so the kind of relationship that they can have is 
either it has a is a kind of relationship which is represents categorical uh, relation or it can have has an can kind of a relationship which represents semantic relatedness. Now, the network model was proposed by someone called Collins and Quillens in 1969 and so what they say, said is that most words in the mental lexicon are related to each other through a network and these networks has links between them. These networks have words and concepts which are connected to each other by links and these links can be either categorical categorical links or it could be semantic link. Now, mental lexicon as network of concepts are connected by semantic links or categorical links and what is semantic link? A canary is a bird for example, look at it, we have a is a relationship. So, when I say canary is a bird, it is explaining a categorical relationship because canary forms in the category of bird. Similarly, bird has wings if I say it is re representing something called semantic relationship. So, bird has wings, birds can fly, these are semantic relationship meaning related things right. But as, as soon as I say canary is a bird or uh, parrot is a bird or uh, lion is an animal, what I am trying to relate or what I am trying to show you is a categorical relationship. Hence, we know that canary has wings. So, uh, uh, and as you can see this is the relate. Uh, so, uh, canary is a bird is, is basically a categorical relationship, but when I say bird have wings, I can deduce from this that canary has wings. Why? Because canary is a bird and so all birds has wings, so canary is a bird which has, uh, which has wings and so canary has wings is the actual deduction and so this kind of relationship exists between concepts into the mental lexicon. Now, there is something called the spreading activation model uh, which was proposed by Colin and Lefters in 19, uh, uh, Lofters in 1975 to explain the idea idea of this mental lexicon. And so, what does it uh, propose? It proposes that activation of one node spreads out to other nodes linked to it. So, what does the spreading activation model actually say? It says that models of mental lexi uh, in the models of mental lexicon activation of one node spreads to another nodes linked to it. So, basically then I have words, different words which are connected to each other in the mental lexicon. And so, if you excite one word or concept, what will happen is the energy which is exciting it, it will spread to all other nodes which are connected to the central node or this central idea or the central word and this idea is called the spreading activation. Now, the very idea that activating one node or one concept into the mental lexicon, it excites all other nodes uh, that can be that or the proof from them is uh, or uh, that leads to accounting for the data from word association and priming task. So, basically from both priming and word association task, the, what it explains is that the spreading activation. So, how, why do we get certain words more related uh, with the word of uh, in question? So, in uh, let us say dog if I say and you say cat or if I say king you say queen. So, why am I getting queen out of king although they are not related to each other. The reason is that they are related together which basically means that they are connected to each other with a higher strength. And so, the moment I excite the word king, the queen will be excited. Although ki king and queen do not like uh, do not lie in the same categorical level in a semantic uh, related map. Now, a little bit of detail about this spreading activation. You can uh, you can go to my previous lectures on semantic memory and the idea of spreading activation and the idea of how semantic uh, networks really work. And you just look at one or two lectures there on the courses on in, uh, uh, the course on introduction to cognitive psychology. Uh, there, they'll you'll find a little bit more detail about this idea of spreading activation and how this spreading activation actually explains the lexicon or how the mental lexicon is arranged and uh, priming studies. So, what are priming first of all? Now, the, what is the meaning of priming? In priming what happens is a partial information is given to you or some kind of degraded information is provided to you and this degraded information later on helps you in uh, in understanding or in recognizing or in, uh, in, in, uh, 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 in perceiving certain other kind of uh, uh, words. For example, a very um, generic kind of priming is if I tell you something about someone, if you have not met somebody before, a new person comes to you or a new person has come to your department and suppose <coughs> even before you meet this person, I give you some information about him saying that he is from that region, this region or little bit information, a very degraded information that, uh, that are linked to that person. The moment you go meet this person, what will happen is your behavior towards him will be primed by the information that I have given.
given to you and so this is basically priming. In priming what happens is some kind of information a pre-information is given to you or a pre kind of uh, information is provided to you and this information then shapes the way you answer certain questions or the way you behave and so if you uh, the, this kind of priming is called semantic priming and so what is happening here is I am showing you words like tree, flowers, leaf and uh, that kind of a thing and then when I present to you PLA normally what people do is since they are already given this kind of letters people tend to fill in NT here to mean plant because they are primed they have been given informations like tree, flower and leaf all related to uh, the the plants all related to the herbivores or, or, or uh, uh, the plant side of it and so most people generally then uh, fill the NT word here to mean plant. But if I show you words like cup, bowl and saucer and then I present to you the PLA generally people tend to write TE here plate because this plate then forms a category with these or it is a sub category or maybe uh, it is the main category of these things. So, these are members of the category plate and these are members of the category plant. So, we tend to refer to the original category and this is what is called priming. So, this is the how the hierarchical model really works. Uh, so, if you look at animal there are two characteristics of it has skin and can move and so if you look into it birds are animals. So, by nature of it birds will have skin and they, they will be able to move because animal is the higher order category and lower order category will have all the characteristics of the higher order category and so if you look at bird it has wings and it can fly. So, then animals may not have wings and fly but birds have wings and fly and also they have skin and they can move and then look at canary which is a part of this bird and so if you look into it the canary is yellow in color and can sing. So, a canary is yellow in color and can sing it has wings and it can fly and it has skins and uh, it can move but not all birds are yellow and they can sing but most birds have uh, wings and they can fly and similarly animals most animals have skins and move but neither they uh, they have most of them have yellow skin and can sing or neither they have wings and fly. So, this is the uh, uh, the way in which the mental uh, lexicon is arranged and so if you look into it this is the fish it can swim it has it has fins it can swim. So, this kind of uh, uh, relatedness is called semantic relatedness and is uh, so any fish is a animal if I look at it. So, this relationship is categorical relationship and this relationship is semantic relationship and so fish has shark and salmon and can bite and is fast and so this is the arrangement which is there. So, hierarchical network model proposes the semantic memory is organized in terms of hierarchical categories. Now, attributes of the higher levels are inherited by categories of the lower level. For example, we know that canary has skin because canary is a bird and bird is an animal and animal has skin. So, as I said members of this category will have all properties or most properties of higher members but the reverse is not true. Now, what the spreading activation model, how do we look at the spreading activation model? For example, let us say by somehow we activate the concept red. Now, this red is related to so many other concepts. On one way, this red is related to rose which leads to the idea that it is leaf, it has flowers, it has thrown. On the other way, the red is related to uh, color category which is green, orange and uh, red. Also red is related to uh, the category of fruits and so you, uh, you excite apple, cherry and pie and also red is related to the word fire which is further related to the fire engine, truck, car, bus and uh, street and similarly the fire is also related to house because the house gets on fire and so this house is related to the street which is again related to the car and so on and so forth. So, as soon as you excite this red through an energy the moment you say red what will happen is all these networks get excited but the way if you look at street this has the lowest excitation but if you look at rose and if you look at fire, if you look at apple and you <coughs> look at fire engine. So, these words, this triangle has the highest activation right because they are the nearest and so they have the highest activation, they have the highest energy related to the word red. Semantic priming, now semantic priming is another find of, find of priming that is used. Now, in semantic priming task what really happens is, 
So, what priming generally does? It measures the associative strength of uh, between uh, words. So, what does semantic priming task does? Is an experimental technique that presents a pair of words and measures the participants' reaction time to those pair of words. Now, target words are recognized faster, which precedes by related primes than unrelated primes. For, and this is called the semantic priming effect. So, what happens in semantic prime is that people are presented with pair of words which are either related semantically or unrelated words and when they are related semantically what happens is people tend to respond to semantic primes faster than when they are unrelated words. So, experimenter presents a pair of words in sequences, participants perform lexical decision task on the second word. So, they see doctor and then they see nurse and so you have to tell whether nurse is a word or not and so in this case it is easier for you to say yes. But if it is a uh, if you see doctor and then see a non word nurse nurse then you say it is a non word but the reaction time that you take in the first is shorter than in the reaction time that you take in the second word which is longer. The reason being that doctor and nurse are semantically related, but doctor and nurse are not. And so, what is the semantic priming effect? In semantic priming effect what happens is target words are recognized faster when preceded by a related than unrelated primes. And so, that is what I have been uh, telling. So, if you see doctor nurse you will have a faster reaction time, but if you see doctor and spoon you will have a slower, uh, slower reaction time the reason being that they are not semantically related to each other and so that explains or that gives us a picture of how the mental lexicon is actually arranged. We also have something called picture and words and so we have something called a picture in word interference effect. In this case what happens is a certain word and a certain picture is presented and so if the picture and words are from the same category the reaction time is also affected by it which basically means that those words that we store in the mental lexicon is not only arranged in the semantic form in the meaning form in the written form it is also arranged in terms of the pictures and so participants see pictures and word names and uh, pic uh, picture and words names picture and ignores the word. So, in, in this case what happens is that uh, this experiment or this kind of work shows you that it is not only in terms of uh, the words are arranged in terms of semantic or meaning is also in, in terms of pictures. Now, we have something called the semantic interference effect in which what happens is the taxonomic relationship yields uh, slower reaction times. For example, reaction time between horse and cat is greater than horse and table. The relation uh, why it is there because horse and cat are related to each other in terms of taxonomic relationships, uh, but horse and table are not related to each other in taxonomic economic relationship because both the horse and cat are from the same category which is animals. But if you look at horse and table they are from horse is from the animal category and table is from the furniture category and so they are not related taxonomically and so the reaction times are uh, then disrupted. Now, categorically related words are compete for selection. So, what we have, have is uh, if we have two words which are categorically related they will compete with each other for selection and so that will influence the uh, word uh, reaction time. We also have something called semantic facilitation effect and so what is the semantic facilitation effect? What does it mean? The thematic relationships yield faster reaction times. For example, reaction time of whiskers and cats is lower than whiskers and table. So, here what happens is this will take more time than this because they are related semantically. Associative related words do not compete for this kind of a selection. So, although we have uh, categorically related word they compete for selection, but if we have associately related word they do not compete for uh, uh, the uh, uh, selection and so this is the uh, kind of priming that we have or priming effect that we have in terms of words and pictures. So, uh, this is on each trial a picture and a word appears on the screen and participants are instructed to ignore the word and name the picture. So, uh, what I will do is I will leave it to you to read it and see how category related, thematic related and unrelated words and this is the average licensee and so how they are related and what kind of um, uh, timing that they are taking. Now, the next thing that we are going to we are looking at cortical organization of the mental lexicon. So, how is the mental lexicon actually arranged? Uh, that is the uh, issue that we are interested in. So, there is something called the dual lexicon model and so what does the dual lexicon model actually do? The dual lexicon model uh, says that it was uh, 
Now, as, as he, uh, it was based on Hickok and Popel's 2007 dual stream model, if you remember the dorsal and ventral stream in, in terms of uh, speech production, the same issue has been used here or the same kind of uh, 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 conceptualization has been used here. And so, what, what does it uh, say? In uh, Gaw proposed this idea in 2012. And so, what does he say that there are two ways, two pathways in which the, uh, the mental lexicon is actually arranged. So, two mental lexicons are there, there is something called the dorsal lexicon and there is something called the ventral lexicon. Of course, if you remember Hickok and Popel's idea of dorsal and ventral stream in word, uh, in, in speech production, the same concept has been borrowed here. And so, what does it say is that there are two different kind of lexicons which are there. You have the uh, dorsal lexicon. So, mental lexicon is of two types. You have the dorsal lexicon and you have the ventral lexicon. The dorsal lexicon is related uh, or is uh, defined for uh, making sound to action, how sounds are converted into action and the ventral lexicon is related to the fact of converting sound to meaning. So, the, uh, on one hand the dorsal lexicon converts sounds into actions, the ventral lexicon is basically uh, responsible for convert, converting the phonological word form or the sound form of a word into its particular meaning. So, dorsal sound to action stream stores phonological word form and ventral sound to meaning links word with semantic representation. You have something called the supra uh, marginal gyrus region of the inferior parietal lobe adjacent to the and lateral fissure and phonological word forms may be stored in this particular area. Similarly, there are uh, differences between them. For example, left hemisphere is fine grained and semantic processing acron and squirrel and similarly the right hemisphere is coarse grain and it processes something called semantic processing which are of coarse grain. So, if you are looking at relationship between lion and stripes, it is basically the uh, right hemisphere which is doing the action because it is the way of the tiger which the comparison happens. But if you are looking at fine grain semantic processing, for example, two different kind of uh, uh, smaller animals, acron and squirrels. In this case, the semantic relationship is happening in terms of the left hemisphere. Okay. So, now we are interested in finding out how these words are retrieved. And so, we have a little bit about em em embodied semantics. And so, what it says is that the body movement also has a lot to do with uh, the understanding of the word or the learning of the word. And so, I will leave it to you to read this. And so, what it basically says that the kind of movement that we do while speaking a word has an effect on uh, how it is learned or how it is coded into the mental lexicon. And so, the last part of this lecture has to do with something called the word retrieval. How are words retrieved? Now, words are recognized. The word recognition, uh, uh, recognition happens by extracting the phonological word form. So, most words are recognized by, ex, uh, by extracting the uh, phonological word form which is from the speech stream and it links it to the mental lexicon or the semantic relationship. So, as soon as a word is given to you, what happens is, is extracted, a phonological form is extracted and a semantic form is extracted and so they are linked together or they are uh, and they are linked together uh, through the mental lexicon. So, the phonological word form relates to the uh, uh, semantic representation through word recognition and the semantic representation is, re is related to the phonological word form through word production. So, in, in terms of word recognition, we extract the phonological, in terms of word recognition, we extract the uh, phonological word form and then link it to the semantic relationship. But for word productions, what we do is, we first find the phonological word form which in the mental lexicon and then express this in terms of the semantic relationship or thoughts. So, word recognition, how does it progress? It is link, uh, by linking word forms in speech stream to semantic representation in, in mental lexicon. This is how words are recognized. So, we link the word forms in speech stream. So, the way you speak uh, to the semantic representation in the, in the mental lexicon and when we produce word, what happens is in produ word production, we find word forms first in the mental lexicon and then express underlying semantic representation in terms of phonological representations. So, spoken word recognition so, how does it uh, really work? Now, hearing a word 
um, and making meaning out of the word has a three stage uh, uh, processing and that uh, was proposed by someone called Marcellin and Wilson in 1987. So, they say that hearing a word and extracting meaning of it uh, of the word or getting meaning out of a word spoken word recognition has a three stage access or a three stage uh, processing system. The first is called the lexical access, the second is called the lexical selection and the third is called the lexical integration. So, in, uh, in the first stage what happens is an acoustic signal from the speech stream is there and that uh, acoustic uh, uh, speech stream or acoustic signal from the speech stream is uh, matched to candidate phonological representation. So, all kind of phonological representation is uh, presented. So, acoustic signal is there and this acoustic signal is then read by the brain and compared to all kind of uh, candidate phonological representation. So, the what possible phones or what possible combination of phones could actually mean what is being said or what is being extracted from the acoustic signal. And so, uh, it is dependent on something called multi uh, multiple parsing ways and something called multiple word candidate. So, basically lexical access the first stage in spoken word recognition. In first stage what happens is matching acoustic signals of the speech stream to candidate phonological representations in the mental lexicon. Now, the speech stream is ambiguous. So, multiple candidates can be considered and no consideration of meaning at this point. So, the first stage uh, the word phonology is extracted and this is compared to multiple a number of um, speech signals at that time and this basically is uh, why multiple uh, phonological forms or my multiple phonological presentation pronunciations or phones uh, are, are present is because uh, the words are passed by different ways and multiple candidates are available. Now, the second stage is called the lexical selection. In this stage what happened is the acoustic input which you have generated from step 1, this is matched to the best fitting word, best word is fitted. So, choosing the best fitting word matched to the acoustic input, context and expectation have an influence at this point. And so, uh, the context in which it is, so what you have is you have a phonology and so best, the best phonology that you have that is extracted and then a meaning is generated out of it and how the meaning is generated based on the context and based on the expectation. So, what is the expectation and what is the context in which it is coming? A best fit word is generated out of it and the third part is called the lexical integration. In lexical integration what happens is the word form which is selected is related to the utterance which is the semantics and syntax. So, here what happens is the link uh, the linking selected word form to overall semantics and syntax of the utterance understanding not just individual words of utterances, but also the role they play in the utterance. So, here what happens is not only the single word that you have spoken or the uh, the word that has come out of the uh, acoustic signal uh, that is uh, that is that is generated or that is uh, uh, that is learned it is also linked to or more information about this word is generated and what is this information about? This information is about the utterance and also the role that this word is playing in the sentence. So, this kind of uh, things are extracted from it and so there are two things phonological semantic representations and semantic representations other concepts or sentences. So, you, you both generate the phonological which is semantic representations of it and then you have semantic representations which are related to other concepts in the sentence. So, what the word may actually mean in the utterance and what role this word is playing in the utterance that is how it is uh, or that is what is extracted from it. Now, most people or most word recognition theories work with something called the cohort model of word recognition. So, what is the cohort model of word recognition? The model of word recognition proposed that listeners initially consider all possible word which matches to the incoming speech stream, but identify the word as soon as the recognition point is reached. This is the model. So, it says that all possible word forms are considered when you are matching the in on input signal and when you have got the best phonological uh, fit and you are matching this with the all the word which is present in the mental lexicon. Now, what happens is you consider all the word till the point of time that a recognition uh, point is reached and from the recognition point on then you get the best word. So, co <coughs> cohort word what is a cohort first of all? A cohort is a sort of words a set of words that begins with the same sequence of phonemes. For example, look at the ELE cohort and with the ELE cohort 
the ELE word we can have elephant, elevator, elegant, elementary. If I e, if I add ELE PH this cohort then there will be only word one word to it which is elephant or ELE PH then I can have uh, some other word but then uh, mostly you would not have a word. The more number of uh, phonemes you add to it the lesser the cohort becomes. So, example cohort is a set of phonemes. So, you have uh, if you have used the ELE word you can have elephant, elevator, elegancy, elementary and so on and so forth. Another cohort you add to it ELEF, elephant and you get elephant only and no other word is there. Now, the point at which a string of phonemes provides enough evidences for identifying a word is known as that word's recognition point. And so, what is recognition point? It is the point where the string of phonemes provides enough identification for the word. So, E L E F and from there you know that the word will be elephant and so the word this particular point where I have add F to the E L E is what is called the recognition point and this is what the cohort model is basically composed of X uh, of the co cohort model it proposes that listeners first consider all possible word matches cohort to the incoming stream and then identify word as soon as the recognition point of is reached. Now, extracting all possible, uh, possible word forms from the speech how does it happen? It is a bottom up process. So, the bottom up process is driven slowly by input without consideration of context or expectation. So, bottom up process even if context primes uh, or context primes one word all words or cohorts are active with it. So, what happens is that uh, through the process of bottom up without looking at the expectations and the context all forms of the word is available and so uh, the cohort model says that we keep on increasing uh, the phonemes and the point at which the recognition point happens at that point only the exact word is matched to, uh, uh, to the uh, the list of phoneme or the word that you are searching for. Now, what is the evidence for this cohort model? We have something called the shadowing task. What happens here is the participant is asked to repeat continuous flow of speech out loud as quickly as possible and typical lad of 200 millisecond before complete word is heard. And so, this basically shadowing task is you have to repeat continuously and so, even if 200 word uh, 200 millisecond lag is there people are able to produce complete uh, word and so, this basically says that the cohort model that all forms of the words are available. We also have something called the gating task in which participants presented with increasingly longer increments of word asked to guess what it is illustrates recognition points. And so, what happens is the point at which the recognition happens after that if you increase the number of words nothing is going to happen the recognition will still take place. Now, top down influence in lexical excess. Uh, top down influence are influenced by context and expectation. So, word in uh, recognition is influenced by uh, the context in which the word is, uh, is coming on the expectation that people have. Sentence superiority effect improve ability to identify words within sentences as opposed to itself. So, it has been believed that if a word is produ produced in a sentence it takes only 200 millisecond for the word to be identified, but if the same word is presented to you alone it takes as long as 300 millisecond for you to identify the word. Also, we have something called uh, top down influence in lexical selection. So, word frequency effect common word recognize more quickly than uh, less common words and also in the visual world paradigm what happens is participants interact with objects and pictures according to spoken instructions. Now, object names are from the same cohort or adults are more likely to select higher frequency item than lower frequency item. And so, visual word paradigm shows that this frequency word frequency has a say in the kind of selection that happens. Now, word spoken spoken work production. How does the spoken word actually get produced? There are two stages of production of the spoken word. One is called the lexical selection and the other is called the phonological encoding. Now, in the lexical selection what happens is particular concepts to abstract word from the lemma and the phonological uh, 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 form encoding what happens is abstract word from the lemma is related to the phonology. So, first you start with finding the correct word to represent a thought and then you relate this word to the phonology or to the pronunciation that is how the spoken work production really takes place. So, first is the lexical selection going from particular concept to abstract word forms lemma for example, dog it could mean dog, puppy, hound, pooch, poodle, river. So, you have to select one of these in the phonological encoding which is the second step. So, this is step 1 and this is step 2 in phonological uh, you have to uh, start going from abstract word from lemma to phonological representation for example, if you select puppy then you have to look at p, 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 p. 
this is the phonological excess. Now, the tip of the tongue phenomena is basically represents that this kind of phonological excess is uh, and if, if you are not able to produce certain words it because of the phonological excess is not correct or not has been not approved. And so, lexical selection without phonological encoding can lead to this um, uh, tip of tongue phenomena. So, you know the meaning of the word, but you do not know how it is pronounced and that is what is the tip of tongue phenomena. And this basically uh, says that there is no systematic relationship between meaning and sound and also the TOT abstract lemma form exists. Now, there are two models which have been pro uh, proposed to uh, look at how word production is done. One is called the Levet feed forward model and the other is called the interactive model. Now, there is a difference between the feed forward model and the, uh, and the, the interactive model. Now, as we know the recognition starts by first naming the thought through a word and this word is then related to the phonology of it and then a pronunciation is made. This is how you produce words. Now, there are two ways to look into how these words are produced. The first is called the feed forward model. In what happens is that each step progresses one by one and there is no interaction. In the interactive model, all stages of the model interact with each other to produce the word. Now, in the best model to explain uh, this word production is something called the Levet's feed forward model. And so, what is this model? Well, it is a feed forward model which is out there and what it explains is that lexical selection leads to phonological um, uh, encoding. So, there are wordless thought and this wordless thought how it becomes sound wave is what the feed forward model explains through 6 stages and what are the 6 stages which are connected to uh, uh, or how are they connected? They are connected both in a feedback manner and a feed forward mon uh, uh, manner. Feed forward is how the model will process on or progress and feedback is a monitoring process which is embedded in the model to monitor if the model is working in the right direction. The uh, and this is thinking without language leading to lexical concept. So, there are 6 steps to it, we will look into the 6 steps one by one. So, each pro uh, process performed in a serial fashion, 6 stages in a serial fashion, feedback through a self monitoring at the end of the production and support comes from reaction time experiments. Now, what are the uh, stages which is there? For example, we think about a baby cat and then we get the word for it kittens and then we look at the phonology of it. So, kitten and s and then the phonology is kittens and then we convert it into the speech stream. So, this is the thought, this is the word, this is the grammar and this is the pronunciation and this is the speech stream or how the wave pattern will look of kittens. So, the first level is called the conceptual preparation level. Here the lexical concept uh, uh, the lexical concept or the concept is expressed by word. In the second stage the lexical selection the basic form of the word is selected in that morphological encoding form and inflection morphemes are needed. So, this is the morphological form. Then the phonological encoding conveys the phoneme strings. This is the morphological form and this is my phonological encoding. The phonological encoding gestural role and motor commands on articulators is done by this speech stream and articulation of the sound wave. So, here the uh, uh, remember the motor theory what it says is the way uh, the pronunciation is that that will tell the motor uh, uh, movements or that will generate the motor movements which will actually generate the word. And so, that that signal to the articulator is done by the sixth stage. And then there is a self monitoring stage which is a feedback from the sound wave to the conceptual preparation. So, when you hear what you are saying and that integrates to the, uh, the, the concept of the word, you will feedback it that whether you are saying the correct word or not and so on and so forth. And so, this is how the model works. So, this is the process conceptual preparation, lexical selection, morphological encoding, phonological encoding, phonetic encoding and articulation. This is the lexical concept, the lemma, the morpheme, the phonological word, the gestural score and the sound wave and there is a self monitoring step one by one and this is how the word is produced this is one model of it and this is called the feed forward model. There is another model which is called the Dell interactive model of uh, the, the uh, word production and this comes from this model was developed from errors in healthy people. Now, it is an interactive model it says that there are higher and lower levels of processing of influ and they uh, uh, influence each other. The Dell model it accounts for speech errors in healthy and brain damaged pe populations as obtained through picture naming and other word production tasks. And so, what is this model like? This model says that there are several layers and these several layers have their independent processing and in between the layer there are several processes which integrate the layer together. So, you have a semantic layer in which what happens is concepts distributed across the network as feature nodes, semantic neighbors, concept with related meanings has overlapping feature. 
uh, node. So, you have a semantic layer, then this is the first layer, you have something called the word layer, one node for each lemma or abstract form and then you have the phoneme layer, which is one node for each phoneme tagged with a syllable position. P O P, P is the onset, O P is the, um, so in, in P O P you will have P as the on, onset, O P as the coda and in the O P you have the O as the uh, in nucleus and uh, the other P as form of it if you remember, I am forgetting a little bit. So, this is this is basically the, the first excess and the second. So, this is my vowel and this is my consonantal string in it and so the nucleus and the coda which is basically so if I am remembering uh, right that is how it was defined and then you have two processing stages. So, basically there are three layers, you have the semantic layer, you have the word layer and you have the phonological layer and each word, each of them have separate representations and they are connected together by using the lexical selection processing stage between semantic and word layers and phonological encoding between word and morpheme layers. So, basically as soon as um, somebody says uh, or you think about kittens, the concept is generated first and then it is related to uh, this concept is then or uh, if you have, yeah, so kitten, so kit, the word is, uh, so the concept of the kitten is generated and so lay, uh, at the, at this level and so then this level talks through lexical access or uh, to the word layer. In the word layer you will have, so you are thinking about kittens and so all words related to kitten gets excited. So, frog, dog, cat, rat, mat. Now, cat, rat and mat will be excited and frog and mat will not be because these are although similar in uh, word which are sounding similar, but they are not meaning similar. And then there is a phoneme layer. In this phoneme layer you will have the D O G, the C O T, R A T and so these phonemes, the onset, vowel and coda and these two are called the nucleus, right. So, remember the P O P. So, P is the onset, the vowel is O and this is the coda and this together is the nucleus and this is called the onset. So, this is how the, the thing really works if you remember from or if you look back at lectures you will see that how these things are explained. So, basically what will happen is these phonemes then uh, will compare itself through the process to the se uh, second process which is called the phonological encoding and this phonological encoding process. So, here is my phonological encoding process what it will do is this kitten concept is generated and then the kitten is then now uh, related to or it is matched to a word and so these are the words which are closest and these are words which are far apart and the words which are related to it these words will actually have certain phonological representations or certain speech sounds and those these speech sounds will be excited. So, once we which are excited are these and the ones which are not excited are these for example, F and these have the uh, little excitation and so it will take feed forward from here, it will take input from here, it will take input from here and the finally word is then identified and this is how the interactive model works. So, it is against the idea of how the feed forward model says that one stage after another stage here what happens is the processing happens at all the stages through all the um, uh, processes which are available. And so, this is how uh, the word uh, processing happens uh, using something called the Dell interactive model. So, this brings us to uh, end of this uh, lecture uh, where we were looking at or what we did was we started off this lecture by looking at how the word is represented in the mental lexicon. So, we looked both at the phonological the, the phonological way in which the word is represented in the, uh, the mental lexicon and we also looked at the semantic way in which it is uh, uh, stored. And so, we looked at these representations how the word are learned and words are represented through uh, this, this kind of uh, property or this kind of um, uh, representations. So, what we did was we looked at several factors uh, for example, the <coughs> base frequency effect and all those decides how it is uh, related. So, we looked at the mental lexicon as both the taxonomic and thematic relationships in which the words are represented and so we looked at how these representations are, are, are basically uh, used uh, for accessing the mental lexicons. Uh, further to it we looked at how the acoustic signal is generated into meaning and the meaning is generated into uh, the, the two stage model of the dorsal and mental stream and how these two stage model actually explains the storage of word. Then we looked at how the words are retrieved from the mental lexicon and so we looked at uh, both the theories of uh, uh, 
spoken word recognition using either the cohort model or uh, the extracting of information based on Leavitt's model or uh, which is which is the, uh, the which is the feed forward model or the Dell interactive model. So, what we did here is we looked at how not only how words are learned what is the word or what is the anatomy of a word how it is represented in the metal lexicon we also looked at how they are recognized. Now, when we move ahead and meet in the next lecture what we will do is we will go a step ahead and maybe start looking at <coughs> how these words are expressed in sentences and how sentences are constructed and what are the various aspects of sentences. So, up till we do that and meet in the next lecture, it is thank you and goodbye from here.